Welcome to a new episode of our Let's Accelerate podcast. We are Luisa and Manuel from Bosch Innovation Consulting, and today we have a special guest, Matt Lerner. Welcome, Matt, and thanks for joining. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Matt worked many years in Silicon Valley at PayPal. After this, he became an early stage venture capital investor at 500 startups in London, where Matt gained deep insights and experiences in what it takes to create a successful business from scratch. Today, Matt is founder and CEO of Startup Core Strength. In addition, he guest lectures at Stanford Business School and Imperial College. Matt, can you tell us a little more about your company, Startup Core Strength? What do you actually do there? Yeah, for sure. I'm happy to. So early stage startups, I, I kind of noticed when I jumped from working inside of PayPal to becoming a VC investor that most of the startups who were pitching me were thinking about things very differently from the way a successful startup in Silicon Valley would approach things. So I think, um, for example, I, I, to, to put it simply, I think um, most people who found a startup, they've never kind of built a startup before. They usually come from a business background or a finance background, and they tend to think of a startup as like a small version of a big company. So you go in and you hire Uh, someone to do sales and someone to do marketing and someone to do engineering and someone to do compliance and someone to do product management. And you build out these teams and you build like a tiny little version of a big company. But I know, you know, I worked at PayPal. I knew people who worked at Facebook, you know, and all these really successful companies, Wealthfront. And it, it looks nothing like that. That's just not how you grow a startup. Uh, I mean, the nice thing about a startup is you don't have to have different departments, silos like that, right? Like you work in a big company and it's so frustrating because there's all these different teams who do different things and they don't talk to each other. So if you have a little startup with 15 or 20 people, why would you do that? Why would you make different silos, right? So in a startup, you get the entire team working together around a single goal, which is going to be, you know, obviously to make the product successful, which means first get the product out there working and number two, get customers. And so that's everybody's job. But I think most people don't realize that. And even if you understand it intellectually, to actually execute that in process, in practice and run your organization, is not an obvious or easy thing to do. So what we do in Startup Core Strengths is we run a virtual accelerator. It's a 10-week program. And we bring in startups and we help them identify what is the most impactful work you should be doing right now. How can you align the entire team around it? And then how can you test things really quickly? Because I think that's the other big difference sort of between a startup and a big company. In a big company, you have playbooks, right? You know how to do st everything you guys do. You've been doing it for so long. And there's, there's like right ways and established best practices. If you've got a startup that's doing something no one's ever done before, you don't have those playbooks. You don't know what matters to customers. You don't know the right logistics. You don't know the right distribution channels, any of that. And so what you have to do is experiment and learn. And most of the things you try in the beginning are not going to work, which is fine, like startups fail. So the key then is, first of all, can you do things very quickly? Because if you're going to screw it up, much better to screw it up in two weeks than in two months or two years. And then the second thing is when you screw, when you fail fast, as they say, make sure you take time to learn from it. So you're running this really thoughtful process where you say, okay, we thought this thing, it didn't work. It didn't work because we were wrong about this other thing. So next time we're going to try it differently. So the other thing I teach companies in this program is to run this metrics-driven process of rapid experimentation. So like two week long sprints where each idea you have, you write it down as a hypothesis, you make some predictions, you try and experiment, you see how the results are different from what you expect. This makes perfect sense to engineers, right? Yeah. And then you're a little bit smarter and you have a better chance the next time. So yeah. That's what yeah. we do. Very cool, sounds very interesting. And so as I learn from your what you're telling us right now is that you're dealing with startups on a daily basis. And you already mentioned that there are many challenges those um, startups are failing. So out of your experience, what are or what is the biggest challenge of startups that, that they really face? So why do most of them struggle when it comes to growth? Um, I mean, ultimately, it sounds kind of obvious, but, you know, startups fail because eventually they don't get enough customers and so they run out of money, right? So it's just, a you know, it's it's like a, a ticking clock and you have however much time you have and you have to go not just get some customers, 
but find a repeatable, scalable, profitable way to get customers. So any startup, most startups can get their first few customers just by looking at their connections on LinkedIn, calling their friends, asking for intros and hustling. But oftentimes, you know, those customers become very expensive to acquire. And obviously you can't repeat and scale that past a certain point, especially if your product isn't very expensive or is low margin or something. So that is to say most startups fail because they fail to find, you know, a repeatable, scalable, profitable way to get customers in short. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so in other words, they didn't find a market needed or something like that. So I don't know, maybe do you have any, any experiences how far you need to go or when it is sufficient uh, market need is identified? When, when can you stop? You know, that's a better way to put it. They don't find customers because they didn't find a market need. Um, <clears throat> let's take an example, uh, before I answer your question about when do you, when do you stop? Um, so let's take Uber. It's a, an example. These guys were, were smart, but they were very lucky. So when Uber started out, the original idea was these guys, uh, Travis and Garrett, who founded Uber, they had each sold their previous companies for tens of millions of dollars. They were rich. And so they wanted to make an app where you could call a limousine anytime you wanted. Sounds nice, right? I, who wouldn't want that? Um, but when they got it out there and what they found out is actually most people really wanted this app and they didn't need a limousine. They'd be happy, you know, with a Prius or whatever. The point was, it was just very hard in most places to find a taxi. And so, but they didn't know that. They didn't start a find a taxi app. They just noticed that they discovered it. But that turned out obviously to be a huge, huge need. So I looked at their original fundraising pitch deck. They actually pitched our, our fund one, um, before I worked there. Um, fortunately, we didn't invest. But um, if you look at their original pitch deck, They said that their best case scenario was that this was a billion dollar business. And even now during the pandemic, they're making over $10 billion a year. So they had no idea how big the market need was. Um, and I think most founders don't most, when they set out. And so really getting out and figuring out some validating some need in the market is, is that like first most important task. So my sort of cheeky answer, see, this is where it'd be good if we actually had a visual podcast. I have like graphs of things, but my cheeky answer is if you're not sure, that's not it. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever been part of a startup that really found product market fit, it's crazy. So that like the, the analogy they say is like, before you have product market fit, it's hard work, like pushing a boulder up a hill. And after you have product market fit, it's hard work like chasing a boulder down a hill. So, I mean, you, they say you literally got customers biting your hand off. So, <laughs> nice visualization. <laughs> yeah, you don't. I mean, you don't have to get super, super, you know, scientific about it. But the bottom line is, it's very easy to sell the product. You can raise the price and nobody notices. The product stops working and people keep trying to use it and get really angry at you because they desperately need it. Right? Those are signs that you found product market fit. In your role as a, as a coach for startups, as I understand it, um, you help them grow the, their business. And of course, we are interested in what kind of teachings and methods and tools you are, um, you're teaching them in order to overcome um, those challenges, find the right market need and grow their business. Can you give us some insights on this? Yeah, sure. Basically, what we teach is sort of a combination of the scientific method, like literally the, what you would learn in you know, physics in uni or biology, and the, the agile scrum process. So the first thing we've got to do if we're trying to find a market need is we just have to talk to customers. So we have people go out and interview customers, and we interview people right when they first signed up, really before they've even used the product, because this isn't about the product. This is about if we're going to market to them, if we're going to sell to them, we need to understand what was in their heads before they found our product. So we use a, a technique. You, have you guys heard of jobs to be done? Yes, uh, Clayton okay. Christensen, I think. Um, exactly. So we use the jobs to be done interview technique and basically go back and walk through their journey. When did you first realize you had this problem? What did you try to do about it first? Where did you look for solutions? Who did you ask? What did you Google? And just understand where the journey and the problems start. And then, you know, probably from jobs to be done that if they didn't actually take any action, if they didn't do anything to try to solve the problem, it's probably not that big a problem, right? So you really want to validate that they're desperate. Well, we tried this workaround of using this software and this software, and we hired this person to do this every Monday morning. And 
Like if they're coming up with all these workarounds, that's a good indication there's, there's a market need. Anyway, so we start with customer interviews and just walking through the whole journey before they found your startup to get a sense for the need and potential messages and channels where we could market to them. That gives us a lot of ideas, turn those ideas into hypotheses. And then we teach teams to literally design, like write a hypothesis, design and run an experiment that you can execute in two weeks to validate or disprove you know, whether that's, you know, whether your hypothesis are right, is right or not. So the second piece after customer interviews that we teach is this idea of running sprints and thinking experimentally and doing experiments. Yeah, just practicing that and getting better at it because it's not a, a normal intuitive way, I think, to think. Yeah, we can. I think we we can very much relate to this um, to this approach, as we in in our Bosch Accelerator program, uh, we we ask our innovation project teams uh, the same. So we're aiming at or asking them to conduct 100 interviews in the first eight weeks. Do we have uh, as well um, a, a certain figure in mind for the startups uh, you coach that you had at least do uh, this amount or are talking to um, that number of people before you can halfway show or starting to see patterns um, in their in their answers to your questions? That's a lot of interviews. Um, you're very ambitious. Yeah. That's impressive. Um, I mean, honestly, the best company, the best companies who work with will routinely make this part of their process and do 20 to 50 interviews a week. But for companies who have never done it before, we really push them to just get to 10 interviews. Because even if you don't see patterns, the difference between zero and 10 interviews is, is 80% of the problem. The difference between 10 and 100 is like the other 20%. Because when you do 10 interviews, it breaks all the old assumptions and mental models you had. And that already, just to realize all that stuff you thought you were you knew is, you know, you need to question that and second guess that is already really powerful. After 10 interviews, some lucky companies will see a pattern. They'll see like these two use cases. Um, unlucky companies, obviously, it takes a lot longer than that. So. Mm. So, and still research shows that actually most startups fail, right? So, um, and you've been, you've been uh, working as a, as a VC and, and invested in, in many startups, I assume. So what is your experience regarding startup success or startup failure? I, I think you, um, you had to take a lot of decisions in which, in which uh, startups to invest in. And uh, you've seen a lot of startups um, trying hard, but still not meeting um, the requirements a VC is is um, is asking for regarding uh, traction or growth or revenues. So, what's your the, the figures or the the thing you have in mind um, when you say you have I don't, I don't know uh, a thousand startups you look at? How many of those uh, will become um, on the short list or become uh, a successful company later on? Okay. So I guess I'll talk about the numbers, the data, and then I'll talk about signs. So okay. the numbers are depressing. I, um, I think I talked about this when I spoke at your innovation offsite. But, you know, we would look at 10,000 companies a year and we'd invest in, I don't know, 200, 300. So two to three percent of those companies we're good enough. Like it's like trying to get into a top university. We invest in the top two to three percent of the companies we saw, and out of the companies we invested in, about five percent of them would be successful, and only one or two percent of them would be really, really successful. So you know, two percent of two percent, basically, we're talking about. That um, sounds depressing. Yeah, and we were, but that was just built into our model. So one of our funds would have seven or eight hundred companies in it, because two percent of seven or eight hundred companies means you're going to have some winners in there. And if you get a big winner, you know, we would invest in a company at a valuation of $2 million, and then it would go public and it would be worth $2 billion or $10 billion. You make enough profit off of that. You, you don't need too many of those to return the fund three or four or five times to investors. Um, but that just means you need to make a lot of investments or the model doesn't work at that early stage. So if you're not running a venture fund, you know, if you're a, a company who's trying to run an innovation program, for example, What that means is you need to plant a lot of seeds. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need to plant a lot of seeds and you need to watch them and you need to, just like you were asking before, know when to look for that traction and figure out where to double down. 
and where to pull back and take those resources and try something different. So um, my, my follow up question would be um, when you now put yourself again in the yes, investor's sir. shoes and yeah. investor's perspective. So how then would you find out in which ventures and which startups to invest and in which, which to dump? So that is the, you're right, that's the hard question. So there's the initial investment and the follow-on investment. The follow-on investment is usually pretty easy because by then, the, you know, we talked about the company has very good traction. If there are lots of later stage investors who are very keen to invest, then we've sort of, in the, the round documents, we've secured permission to participate in those rounds. So we've kind of snuck in there. So we would always take those opportunities. But the initial investment, I guess that's a probably a more useful question. So the first thing to say is you've got a type one error and a type two error here. So if we're going to invest in 800 companies and we know that 750 of them aren't going to amount to anything, you know, in making an investment in a company that turns to zero isn't a big mistake. That's built into the model. But the false negatives are a problem. So when Uber comes in and pitches us and we say, no, we don't like, we don't, we're not so sure about the founding team and they walk out the door and then, you know, they have Uber and it's making 10 billion a year in, you know, in revenue, that's a huge mistake, right? Because that one investment alone might've returned the fund again, three or four times. So we're really trying to avoid a false negative. We're always asking ourselves, if this works, how big could it be? So you take this little software company, you say, look, if they do an amazing job and they fill their niche, they can make $10 million a year. That's not very interesting to us. But a company that maybe has a lower chance of success, but if it's successful, it could be $10 billion a year. That's much more interesting to us. In terms of advice, so first is how big can it be? And then the next piece is their chance of success. But the two pieces of that we're looking at, one is the team. And that's a combination of like, do they have relevant domain experience enough that they're playing in a market where they already come in with some understanding that nobody else has. And then two is, you know, are these extraordinarily talented, passionate, driven entrepreneurs? Are they leaders? Can they inspire people and put a great team around them? And, you know, will, will they grow into great leaders? You know, how do you look at a 20 year old Mark Zuckerberg and say, <laughs> yeah, someday this guy's going to be able to run a company with a hundred thousand employees, you know, before he's 35 years old. Um, yeah. The other piece of it is we would just love to see traction. If there is already evidence at this early stage that they've found a market need, the numbers won't be big necessarily at that stage, but you sort of look at the quality of the traction. So are, are they getting a lot of customers like referrals, people telling their friends about it? Are customers sticking around for a long time and using the product more every week rather than less? So the traction and sort of the qualitative side of it was the other big indicator. Cool. Very interesting to to get that perspective from you, and you already mentioned uh, the BMI summit from from last year, and I all yeah. I still remember that one sentence from you that um, it's very important to get customer engagement. Um, so what would be interesting for me, and I think also to the listeners, that you can give a little bit more insights on what you mean with customer engagement, for example, when it comes to bringing products to your customer, when when growing your own startup. Um. Yeah, sure. So basically customer engagement, I mean, it very simply means people use your product, want to use their product, <laughs> you know, and it becomes an automatic part of their, their life to where you don't even think about it. And then we're just, you know, that's easy to say, where does this get tricky is when you suddenly have to measure it. Um, you know, like suppose you have um, a meditation app. Okay. If someone meditates once a month, are they an engaged customer or not? If someone opens the app once and tries it and never uses it again, obviously they're not. What if they use it three times in the first seven days? Are they likely to stick around or not? So just choosing like what is the actual customer behavior that looks like engagement, that's predictive of engagement, it takes a while till you have enough data to figure out what those metrics mean. Mm -hmm. And then behind that, what is the customer experience? What's the early life experience you have to provide to people to sort of get them impressed with the product the first time they try it, so you can increase the chance that they're going to keep using it. Mm -hmm. So you're currently mentioning the increasing the chance. So how can you increase the customer engagement? Do you have any methods, tools, best practices? How can you increase it? For example, I think it's, it's also something different to get customer engagement on physical products or on digital services. Um, so 
I mean, I've worked a bit with physical products uh, as well, but I guess that, so there's two, I break the problem into two parts. So the first is they, you know, they've never heard of your product. They try it out and either they like it and they keep using it or they don't like it and they stop using it. So one thing is just to get them from zero to, yes, I will, this product will be part of my life, right? So if you get a new app, you'll open it once or twice, you'll try it out. That doesn't mean you love it. That doesn't mean you're a customer. The, to the app, it looks like you're launching the app and using it. So like their numbers are going up, but not, not necessarily because you might not stick around. And then you get over that threshold. And then there's this other piece, which is like, do you keep using it all the time? And so like, you know, when we were at PayPal, somebody would say, be selling things online and using our product every day for six months and then suddenly stop using it. That's a different problem entirely. They obviously were getting value and then something changed and the product stopped being useful to them. And that's a very different problem and a different solution than just getting people to use it in the first place. So getting people to use it in the first place starts with understanding, you know, to use jobs to be done. What is the progress you're helping people make in their lives? People don't buy your product, they use it to achieve some goal. So getting very clear understanding of what is that goal and then making sure that when they start using the product, you guide them, you show them the right features, you make sort of the happy path, lead them to achieving that success very early. So famously, Facebook figured out, kind of obvious, but if you start using Facebook and you don't have any friends, Facebook kind of sucks, right? <laughs> That's right. So they figured out. <laughs> Not uh, just I mean, Facebook. <laughs> yeah, any social media app. Um, and you could say maybe these days Facebook sucks anyways, but uh, <laughs> that's a whole nother discussion. Um, so what they figured out is you need to have seven friends in your first 10 days with Facebook. And once you did that, you would keep using it. Netflix, when they first launched, they figured out that you needed to find at least three movies you wanted to watch in your first 90 seconds playing with the app. And so they spent a lot of time refining the machine learning algorithm for their title DVD title recommendation engine to make sure that right away you found movies you wanted to watch. So first is just understanding what do people want and making sure you get it to them right away. And then you're looking at what percentage of people who start using the product get sort of across that threshold to where they'll keep using it. Cool. Very nice insights. Also, I, I didn't know that from, from Facebook and also from Netflix. And I think that's something very interesting to, to see how they measure if there's a real customer engagement behind them. Yeah. Really, really cool. For a physical product, I guess if it's an expensive product, you know, they've already put most of the research in. Is this actually the, you know, the centrifuge that we want in our factory. So once they put it in, you know, usage and engagement is kind of a given. Uh, but software, obviously, it's a lot, you know, a lot more of the burden falls on after the purchase, getting people to really adopt it. And then same thing with inexpensive products. You know, somebody might buy, you know, some electronic gadget or something, use it a couple times and then throw it away. And, you know, no, they don't really care, but you're not going to sell too many more of those things if people don't like them and aren't using them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, Matt, we are already coming closer to the end of our podcast. And I would like to do the famous sentence exercise with you where we would like to start <laughs> three sentences. And uh, we ask you to just complete the sentence in a short time. So just think of the perfect answer to the start I'm giving to you. So <laughs> I'm, I'll start with the first sentence now. So one thing I would always recommend to startups. No matter how sure you are that your business will be successful, take time to validate the customer's need and their willingness to pay and take action and actually use your product. That's a nice, nice advice. <laughs> Then the next one, the biggest mistake in my business life was. I love that you're asking that because I think a really important part of the growth mindset and learning is being able to talk about your mistakes and reflect on them honestly. Um, for me, I think going back the biggest, mis I mean, there's some like obvious mistakes, you know, I was in Silicon Valley, there's maybe companies, jobs I should have taken, although <laughs> PayPal did just fine. <laughs> I shouldn't complain. Um, I think the biggest one for me was kind of underestimating myself too early and not going for it with bigger roles and bigger opportunities earlier in my career. They're very nice. So I think the last sentence is like a completion of this one. So if you could give an advice to your 20 years old Matt, what would it be? 
You know, it sounds like this cliche, they say, you know, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? You know, and it's easy to say that, but it's hard to actually believe it and take a risk. So I tell 20 year old Matt, you know, like I didn't know in Silicon Valley in 1996 what, what was coming. And I'd say like, you're about to be in one of the greatest, you know, growth and innovation tsunamis in the history of mankind and go out and, you know, don't waste a minute of this, find the biggest, best opportunities and get yourself stuck into them and be bold and don't worry about, you know, screwing up or getting fired or anything and just go for it and make the most of this. Great, I man. I could I... go back and say that to him. <laughs> But, uh, but I think this is an advice you can give to any 20-year-old, or even 30-year-old, uh, whatever-year-old um, um, guy or woman um, who, is, who is interested in innovation and, and growing business, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Matt, it was a pleasure having you on our podcast. Thank you very much again, and all the best for you and the startups you're coaching. All right. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Luisa and Manuel. Great chatting to you. Yeah.